I'm really, really excited about this webinar today. If anyone saw my post on LinkedIn, I'm actually really excited to um, be an attendee on this webinar and learn some things. And I've got some really um, amazing uh, presenters on this webinar today as well. Uh, my name is Kelsey Johnson. I am the head of marketing at Partner Fleet. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and take us uh, into the presentation as people filter in because we've got a little bit of an intro introduction and I want to get into the good stuff. So this webinar is on automation for partner leaders. We're going to be talking a little bit about, um, you know, what you should actually automate, when you should automate, and when you should maybe not automate something as a process. Um, and then going through some real uh, example use cases of, you know, you definitely should be automating this and here's how to go through the process of putting that together. I have three incredible founders and CEOs who are all both experienced with tech because they're all founders of tech companies, but they're also all experienced in partnerships as well. So we've got like the creme de la creme of people uh, for this presentation uh, going on here. I'm flattered, Kelsey. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Quite an intro. All right. Well, let's yeah. get started. Go to the next slide. We're going to run a, a quick poll uh, very quickly. Let me see if I can get this up and running to see. Let's see. All right. So pop. Um, just answer our poll really quickly now. I'll have you go to the next slide, Rob, if you don't mind. And um, let us know for your partner program, you know, what is it that, uh, how many people are in your partner program? How many people are you dealing with here? So, you know, in terms of automation, obviously, if there's just one of you, <laughs> that's going to be crucial for your job. But even as you get up into these sort of bigger, um, you know, more, more like bigger teams, automation is going to be something that you have to, you know, document a lot more, but, you know, we just kind of want to get a gauge of who it is that's here, what it is that you're looking to do. And actually we did a survey. And so if you'll take us to the next um, slide, Rob, while everybody's answering the poll. Sorry, I'm, I'm not good at this. <laughs> <laughs> Our master slide uh, slide guy, Rob. Um, we asked you all in, you know, when you were registering for this webinar, we asked you, what is it that you are already automating? And what is it that you'd like to learn to automate? And so this is a sort of combination of both of those things, but far more heavily on the, what would you like to be automating in your partner program? So partner onboarding huge key one, right? That's something that can be extremely laborious or, you know, not done properly if uh, you have to do it all manually, just because there's so many factors there. Uh, partner referrals, account creation, co-selling and co-marketing, um, account mapping, deal registration. And then I really like this one, initial reply to partners who submit an interest form. This is something that is, you know, if you automate it, it like it's really easy and it makes the person feel important. And then, you know, if you don't, then it can be an extremely laborious process for you to uh, follow up on all of that stuff. This is actually just a really small um, group of the things that people talked about, but we are going to dive into some of these things in this presentation. And, you know, if by the end there's something else that you, you know, feel like we didn't cover, we want to continue to uh, bring you guys this content and um, build out these examples for you. So definitely let us know, continue to let us know in the chat. And uh, yeah, I am going to close our poll now. Let's see. And uh, let's move on to the content. Let's, let's dive into what it is that we're gonna be talking about today. Oh, first of all, sorry, uh, let me introduce our presenters. So we've got three, like I said, founder, uh, tech founders and uh, partnership people, CEOs and founders. Amazing. We've got Eddie Patch from, he's the CEO and co-founder of Partner Portal IO. He specializes in scaling revenue for B2B organizations, and he's based in Manhattan where you'll find him scootering recklessly on a sidewalk with his daughter. 
again, not too reckless, recklessly, I hope. Manhattan is not, not a always. place to be doing that. No promises. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got Rob from, who's this uh, co-founder and CEO of Superglue, a partner ecosystem engagement platform for SaaS companies. Uh, before that, he founded a SaaS company that generated up to 70% of its eight-figure revenue via partners. So he is a partner expert um, for sure. And then we've got Kenny. Kenny's the CEO and co-founder of Partner Fleet. Um, he's my boss. We work together at Car uh, Partner Fleet. He's a no-code partner. Uh, partner Fleet is a no-code partner marketplace platform. Um, before founding Partner Fleet, he actually ran tech partnerships and was an early employee at G2. So he is a developer. He's a CEO, co-founder, and also has an entire career of experience in partnerships. So we've really got the the cream of the crop here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks Kelsey. for coming, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having us. All right, now let's dive in a little bit. If you'll take us to the next slide, uh, Rob. Um, let's. I'm going to pass it over to Kenny to talk a little bit about um, why you should really use automation briefly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, on this slide, Kelsey, can we move the headshots to the left um, so that we can see this full graphic for a little yeah, bit? Absolutely. Um, so, one of the things that around automation is why should you use it? What's the point of it? And ultimately, it's looking at what you're doing on a regular basis, how often you're doing it, how long it takes you, and whether or not you can save time by automating it or get consistent results and scale up and do more of it by automating it. I know, Rob, you have great context here with um, your opinion on automation and what you've done. So why don't you give some of that? Yeah, I think, I mean, so when we start working with companies, very often we talk about their goals, things that they want to automate. And one thing that I've learned is that um, all too often people start automating, start diving into automations too soon. Right? Uh, I've seen a lot of cases and I, in a lot of cases, I blame myself where, you know, we build amazing automations and then we realize that there is stuff that, um, that is only that we automated a process that only takes place twice or three times a month. And very often that just doesn't make sense. There are exceptions. That's what we talked about yesterday, right? In our preparation session where you have certain tasks that have such a high priority. And if you overlook them, there are massive downsides and it makes sense to automate them. But all too often, I think um, automation is something that is too random uh, and people I think very, it, it makes sense to take a step back, think about your goals, your priorities, think about different tasks that happen, the, the time these tasks take, the, the third dimension is probably the importance of tasks, and then prioritize your uh, automation projects. Yeah, I really like the, the topic there about figuring out what is um, the prioritization there of like, is it worth doing? I mentioned yesterday, right? I've done automations where all they are is actually a calendar meet invite. So I know that, oh, that one thing I do once a month that's incredibly important, like running payroll, which isn't automated, but if I forget to run it, it's a problem. I have a calendar notification. That's my personal automation to make sure it gets done. It happens rarely, but it's incredibly important. I think that's a good point, by the way. In automation, very often I see people that look at a process and they want to make, automate everything, right? Kind of create this hands-off process. And sometimes payroll is a great example. Same for, I have that automation as well, at least remind us. But uh, probably going through a process of automating that process in smaller organizations like ours would not make sense. I still log into the tools. I move, you know, a couple of documents yep. from here to there. Uh, and I trigger payroll, and that's and that's fine. Um, and I think that's a very important point. But there are certain parts of that process that I do need to automate because uh, that yeah, time consuming, annoying, or I could overlook them. When you, if you put yourself in the shoes of a of a large organization like you were at before, and you look across your everyday work workload, like how would you prioritize? Where where would you start? Are you looking at the number of activities that that are occurring on a particular task? Are you looking at where it falls in the funnel, like how are you separating that, Rob? Yeah. One of the things that I learned is that, yeah, I look at that, right? I look at the amount of activities and that kind of stuff. 
Uh, but I also look at the, uh, at the impact. Um, so especially when you start automating things and it feels, you, you have somebody, especially in a big organization, that is going to look at what you did, right? And if you tell them I automate this and that, they can't clearly link these automations to, um, you know, for example, revenue, um, then it might be harder to justify further initiatives that, you know, kind of take you down that path. So I think you do have to be somewhat strategic in terms of what you want, but you also in big organizations need to look at like, what is the broader goal? How can we contribute to that? So it's a, yeah, it, it has to be a, a prioritization exercise that you go through. Yeah. Right. I think the, this is a, it's a good transition to when, when to automate and when not to. <laughs> One of my favorite topics, uh, I like the visualization that you picked here, Kelsey. Um, the um, one thing that I've seen quite a lot is also that companies automate things that they haven't figured out yet. Uh, so I see this happening with um, a lot of the like a lot of very early partner programs where people haven't figured out who's the ideal partner. How do we get them, you know, to for example submit the first lead? But they already start thinking about automation, and you end up with a garbage in, garbage out process. You should say shit in, shit out, uh, because it's just you. Yeah, that, that's 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 a big problem. That's a big challenge, right? Like if you don't have, a, you don't need to have a perfect process, but I do think you need a pretty solid idea of what you want to do, or you need to have somebody that can help you with that, can give you guidance in terms of what is the best and pro class process look like, because otherwise you're just doing mediocre things at scale. I'm not sure how you guys feel about that. Yeah, um, I, I like to think about automation and when not to automate is don't automate a process that you couldn't give to an intern and have them do it consistently over and over again. If you've got your process figured out to the point where you could hire an intern who can't think for themselves and just follow your step-by-step -step list and get the same output or similar output, then that's a process worth automating because you know exactly what you need to do end to end to get the same output. Great point. So topics to automate. I think Eddie, you had a couple of points here yesterday. Uh, yeah. So kind of looking forward, we're going to go through some tactical examples and we're going to drill into three of three of these that we're looking at. So there are a number of ways that you could automate. We could probably go on for hours talking about this. Uh, the examples we're going to go through coming up are going to be around strategy and design, uh, co-selling, co-marketing, managing and reporting. Uh, of course, when it comes to enabling, any type of training, incentivizing, there, there's a number of additional automations you could do. Uh, but those are the three examples we're going to go into. At the end, we're going to go through some uh, more uh, concepts around measuring and maintaining. And so if you, if you want to hang around to the end, we're going to go through that as well. Uh, so for the first one, I'm going to hand it over to Kenny, and he's going to kick off uh, the first example we're going to walk through. Awesome. Yeah. So um, as mentioned a little bit in my background, my um, experience is technology partnerships. I owned integrations, API, the API platform at G2 and other companies. And so one of the key things for me was how do I figure out a partner roadmap of what we're going to work on, what we're going to focus on, and how do we then actually drive that to adoption? And so in this scenario I've kind of laid out here, I'm going to talk about how you can take those disparate feedback sources, like a customer asking about a Salesforce integration on a call versus CS ticket versus your partner marketplace, collating all of that into a feedback tool like product board. And then from there, it's still manual. It's still, that's where you go and analyze that data. You work with your partners to figure out what the process is to get that integration built or get that partnership off, partnership off the ground. But once you have that, you already have all the data of who was interested and you can actually automate driving that adoption through a standard go-to-market process. And so I'm going to walk through that first process, a few examples I've used before about taking that feedback and getting it into a tool like Product Board. Rob, next slide. Um, so I've used um, tools like 
Gong and Fathom. So they, they'll record your calls, but you can actually set up triggers. So in this case, I'm showing a trigger that um, I've done in Gong where anytime any term within partnerships, so integrations, APIs, partnerships is mentioned on the call, it'll automatically feed that into product board. Same thing with Zendesk tickets. As an example, you can feed all of those requests in. Um, and then at the bottom here, hidden, I think, by our faces right now, is also activity on a partner marketplace. And so something like Partner Fleet, where you can see the activity your customers are doing, you can automate all of that either through direct integration or a tool like Zapier to pull that data into product board. Where this is valuable is this now gives you an automated way of getting all that data together. You now know who is asking for it. So you have the account information, you know what they're asking for in context, because it's not just, oh, do you have a Salesforce integration? But it's, oh, a Salesforce integration would be great because of X, Y, and Z. And then you can use that information to build your partner roadmap, reach out to potential partners and say, hey, we've got these five accounts asking for us to work together. All of that data can then go into whatever your onboarding and recruiting automations look like. But then the other piece about using a tool like Product Board is the fact that it actually generates an ideas portal where your customers can go and vote on things. So you could put out there 10 different partnerships you're going to work on and actually have your customers tell you which ones are the most important and continue to use that data as you go into that recruitment and building phase. By the way, a I lot of companies. Oh, go ahead, Rob. No, I was just going to briefly comment. I, I love all of that because it's, we're basically using automation to use data more systematically. I think in partnerships, we're still, we could be a lot more data driven. Uh, you know, if we look at other departments, how they work mm -hmm. uh, and have the data guide us towards taking the right action. So that's why I love this and what I think yeah. automation should help us do. I yeah, love this. Same thing. I love this, same I thing. Love this uh, too. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Kelsey. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say, like, this also, you know, we've taught, like, we went to um, the Supernode conference and so many of the presentations were on pitching to your C-suite and bringing, you know, bringing the right data and bringing the right story to advocate for the stuff that you're doing in partnerships. And this is like such an amazing automation to, in the background, be collecting that data so that when you need it, you really can uh, make a case for your own program. Yeah, and not, yeah. not to mention like defining roadmap. Uh, of course, this is a great way for the internal and getting the buy-in on C-suite, but products like Product Board and their competitors, they also give you that external option for roadmap upvoting and getting that in front of potential prospects and customers and allowing them to also contribute to the roadmap of all, all being data-driven and automated is, is super, it's great. Kenny, we yeah. got a question too before you move on. Okay. Um, do these tools um, and the tools specifically product board also help bucket these requests by the why a customer wants the feature? So the context uh, around why they want it, not just what they want. Yes. So the information will be pulled in through the integrations. Um, and then you can actually create your own buckets of whys in product board, for instance, and start putting them together. And so when looking at a partner roadmap, maybe one of your whys is break into the CRM market. And then you start to know which partnerships your customers are telling you are most important to break into the CRM market. And so you can do a business why as well as the why the customer wants the integration. Um, one other piece I was going to mention here is what a lot of companies do right now, what a lot of partnership people I talk to right now do instead of this is they have a every other week call with their sales team or their CSM team, their support team and ask for this information. And they're only going to hear from the loudest voices. This gets rid of that personal bias to actually hear directly from the customer and then use that to sell to your internal teams, sell to your partners. I've used this process to actually get a partner who we'd never talked to before to build an integration to our platform. Awesome. And a lot of companies will stop here, but you now have all of this information already and you should use it 
to really create a go-to-market process. So we've had customers of Partner Fleet who create a waitlist process on their marketplace where companies will sign up and say, oh, that integration's coming, I'm interested. So you're generating early adopters, but you also have all of those accounts already in Product Board that have told you this is important to them. And you can automate that into a marketing automation campaign, potentially even into ads to really drive early adoption and drive those conversations further or re-engage those prospects after you launch the integration. This is something that I've seen successful partnership programs. They're the ones who also have that go to market as part of their plan whenever they're launching a new partnership. And this is a way to help with that. Cool. Eddie, I think you're uh, up. Yeah, thank you. That teased me up nicely. Uh, this is a topic I'm super excited to talk about. Uh, this is going to be great for any partner marketers that are that are here live. If you are here, love to see you in the chat. Um, but anyone who also isn't fortunate enough to have a partner marketer on their team, I'm going to go through some co-marketing examples and things you could do uh, to amplify your marketing alongside your partners. So this first example I'm, I'm showing you here uh, is around leveraging your account mapping. Uh, if, you're, if you are on the free plan with Reveal or the free plan with Crossbeam, um, you might not have full access to some of the automations I'm talking about here. Uh, but if you're on the paid plans, absolutely, you'll be able to do everything I'm going through. Um, so I want to take you to an example in your mind, in your inbox. We all get the notifications when there's a new overlap or you, you find out that one of your partners is working with somebody uh, for a new overlap customer, oftentimes we'll take that email, we'll go reach out to the AE that's on the deal or kind of do like a one-off check-in with, with the sales team. And so the, the better way uh, in terms of automating would be to allow those overlaps to start funneling into a dynamic list in your CRM. So whether you have HubSpot, Salesforce, Pipedrive, whatever it might be, um, creating that dynamic list that's constantly updating with all the overlaps that you're experiencing with, with your partners. And below that, I kind of showed you some additional workflows you could do with those dynamic lists. Uh, most importantly, uh, get them marked as partner influenced, get them marked as marketing contacts, and we can start to do some really cool stuff with it. Uh, so Rob, on the, on the next slide, I'll show you an example of a few things you could do. Uh, so dynamic lists populating, we know that they're, there's a prospect or a potential uh, prospect in our, in our world. They're, they've entered into our ecosystem by way of our partner. And it's gonna be a delay in some time before our AE reaches out or gets introduced and connected. So what we do is start building air coverage as soon as that overlap takes place. And so as soon as we know that somebody is, has either become an open opportunity with one of our partners or has become a customer, we could start running ads, uh, display ads on those, those prospects. And so I'm using Rollworks. Uh, you can plug it into a number of different ABM platforms or just general DSPs. Uh, but this is a great way to start putting, planting the seed, getting feelers out there and automating that, that first touch and air coverage even before the conversation begins. Another example on the next slide, Rob, would be taking that dynamic list and creating some email automation and trigger emails that take place. And so let's say that I know I have a new overlap with my partner. It's a great way, especially if I have that contact already in my database, it's a great way to say, hey, look, I understand you've been evaluating our partner. Uh, you're looking for a new account mapping tool. We're actually a partner of, of the company you're looking at. And that's the, the reason why I'm reaching out. And so it's, it's a very kind of transparent uh, outbound uh, that comes directly from our salesperson and sometimes directly from our, our C-suite, uh, me. Uh, and, and basically it's just a great first touch and make sure that we're not having to do those kind of one-off emails here and there uh, whenever I see an overlap. So another great way to automate. I got a question on that, Eddie, if you don't mind. Yeah. What do you recommend with regard to making this email feel more like the per like like it's coming from a real person versus, you know, having it seem more like an automated email, 
do you think that do you think that it's better like you get a better response when those the like copy of that email sounds really like you and it sounds like you sat down to send it out yeah, yeah, good question. So we'll try to use as many custom object or hyperfields in the email as we can. And it always comes from a person and uh, not, not from marketing. And so one thing that we've talked about, and, and Rob, uh, his examples are going to be really hit on this, is the, the idea of having the emails come directly from an individual. Uh, they're much, much, much higher response rates, higher open rates, um, and try to customize as best as best we can. Keep in mind, this is kind of just like a very basic tee up. Um, it's just a way to ensure that we're not allowing any of these overlaps to fall through the cracks and that we're, keep, we're keeping up with all of them as they're happening. Yeah, I have a, an additional question as well. Um, in this case, it, as I understand it, you're emailing the company that the overlap is of, right? About Crossbeam as your partner. Are yep. you letting Crossbeam know that this communication is happening, that you're kind of reaching out and saying, hey, we're huge fans of Crossbeam when that overlap happens. And are they giving you any credit in from a partnership perspective for that type of reach out? That's that's a good point. Um, so typically, this just goes into our partner influenced uh, marketing in our own CRM. Uh, we usually don't start to engage Crossbeam in this example until we're a little further in the sales process. Maybe there's a demo scheduled at that point. Uh, but no, we, this isn't something that we're sharing analytics on with them or kind of like passing over. Okay. It's not a bad idea though. I love those campaigns though. Like this is, this stuff really works. Um, pre cross beam I on my, uh, years ago, I, we used to do stuff like that and it's just so powerful. I think the thing about email marketing or just email campaigns, uh, is that if you are extremely relevant, um, then personalization is as important. Sorry, by the way, I don't know. There are a bunch of planes flying by in the background <laughs> over here. It's never happened. Maybe I don't know what's happening. But yeah, but coming back to that, right? Like relevance is a huge driver. I get emails that are not personalized at all, but they, are, they address exactly the main issue that I'm facing at the moment. Is the reply. Um, so I think that works. Obviously, you can enhance it but with, with personalization, etc. And we'll talk about that. And I'm going to talk about my. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a number of things that now with generative AI that can uh, help with that that intro. And I know your tool is is has incorporated that into giving that prompt. Uh, but even just being able to leverage AI on the first, second, or second like one two punch uh, can go a long way. Uh, major CRMs haven't quite gotten to the point where they're allowing you to pipe that in, but if you're using any email marketing automation platforms, kind of like the, the, the tier three, tier twos, uh, all of them have really adopted this and uh, embraced it. Um, so it's, it's kind of worth exploring. I would say if you, if you want to get that additional personalization, yeah. I threw in a one extra bonus here. So. There's a, a few companies out there that allow you to do some interesting things with content. And so I wanted to throw this in there because we all, when we partner with somebody at least once a year, if not two or three times, we want to come together and put together a joint blog post. Um, and we want to automate some type of content calendar and whether it's around an integration, announcing the partnership or just doing uh, some thought leadership on any particular topic. And oftentimes getting to the point where you're producing a joint outline can be really time consuming, uh, not to mention, you know, you want to maintain balance between the two partners. And so this, this is an easy way to just queue up a, an outline for both parties. There's a, there's a tool called Byword and it's, uh, it, it, what it can do is take multiple URLs and scrape them and basically write up a joint article for you. And it, it's not going to be what you're going to go publish, but it's going to be the initial outline that you could start with. And so in this example, I pulled an article from Partner Portal about uh, second party data that we published. And then I pulled an article from Partner Fleet, and it gave me a few suggestions around the other topics we've talked about, but like what, what it wanted me to prompt the article to, to be. And so if you go to the next slide, what it did is it went and scraped the, the two articles and then came to a point where it, it it put together an outline for me. And so it, it mentioned the, uh, whoop, sorry, going crazy. Such a mediocre 
<laughs> host, I don't know what I turned on here. Um, there we go. Sorry about that. Nice. <laughs> um, so what it did was produce an article that combined both of our content into one. And I could take that and move it onto a Google Doc and we could start working on it. The best part about that is that it, it did recognize the voice of our brand and the voice of Partner Fleet. It, it recognized the terms that we already use in our own terminology. Uh, and it, gave, it gives us a great starting point. Um, so next time you're, you're going to be kicking off a joint blog post, think about doing something like this. It could save you at least a few hours, if not more. Eddie, I mean, um, these look fantastic. We should do these legitimately. You and Kelsey should start working through it. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. Uh, we will. Uh, but <laughs> there's, there's the screenshots, a little teaser. Um, but yeah, that, that's it for, for my section. Um, I'm excited to hand over to Rob. He's got some really interesting things leveraging super glue. Um, so we'll, we'll pass it on to him. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, I, I talk about super glue and show you how to set up certain automations, but please keep in mind, like we're obviously not the only tool that's out there and you can use different tools. Uh, you probably have to combine a couple of automation tools to replicate some of the stuff I'm going to show, but um the goal is really to show you what's possible and i want to talk about co-selling um just because i think there are huge opportunities in, in that space uh so what we're going to do in this this example is we're going to connect salesforce crossbeam ChatGPT, slack and gmail to superglue and then automate the co-selling workflow um, by the way the whole this setup takes 13 minutes so it's very often these automation tools are pretty straightforward to set up um so when it comes to co-selling the big challenge that I think a lot of organizations face, and I saw that in the beginning of the uh, of the webinar when we showed kind of your answers uh, as to like what you're automating, two things that stood out was you said like, or some of you said you're automating account mapping and you're automating co-sell alerting. Uh, I think that's awesome, um, but it's not enough. It just means that you initiate the process of the co-sell but the question is what happens next is everything that happens after these alerts happen you reaching out to somebody keeping people involved in the deal your partners involved in the deal is that all manual because if it is it's it's very limiting right because you've only um if you look at the you know the, the entire process you've only eliminated the effort in the first step so i'm very passionate about automating um basically outreach to your partners when you have a, a new crossbeam overlap uh, but the other thing that i want to focus on today that i think is extremely exciting is keeping people involved in the co-sell process so basically not having a partner refer you a deal you handing that deal to your ae and then kind of not knowing what's happening the partner not being aware of what's happening and the deal at some point in time closing and everybody's going to be happy I, I think the, the, the proper co-sell process, or that's what we see, should be one where the partner hands you a referral and you keep them involved in the sales process because that A, uh, keeps them excited and makes sure oh, they feel valued. Back. Rob, we lost you for just, oh. I don't know if that was everybody, but I, I think I lost you for like just maybe 20 seconds if you would back oh. up. <laughs> uh, okay, sorry. So yeah, so I was talking about the co-sell process, right? Like uh, us focusing on the co-sell process where we rather than uh, you know, handing over a lead to one of our AEs and then you know, letting them do their job, we should keep our partners involved. We should basically uh, we should keep them updated proactively, right? rather than telling them you need to go there or there, like look for the stuff, we should keep them involved proactively to keep them excited, but to also enable them to help us win their deal. Right? The, the, the result of an involved partner in the deal, the sales process is a higher ACV, higher close rate, and a shorter sales cycle. So I'll show you how, how we can automate some of that stuff. And I will need to switch to another screen. Um, I'm, I'm not very good at this. Uh, I think you've already realized that I'm not great at uh, <laughs> uh, doing these, this stuff. But here we go. I think we should. Uh, Sharing your All screens right. on webinars is a completely different skill set than building automations. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I suck at it. <laughs> I think next time you're probably going to nominate somebody else. Uh, you can see like a super glue or a dashboard, right? Yeah, I've got a great, oh, yeah. um, I've got a testimonial too, before you move on, Rob, uh, from Hope Baker. <laughs> she says that they've reactivated three partners that went dark with super glue. Uh, I love Many it. Many great <laughs> use cases. So I love it. Awesome that we're nice. going to see that in action. 
I love it. Uh, and uh, yeah, I hope we're setting this up uh, for with hope next week as well, actually. But uh, yeah, so so let me uh, let me show you how um, how how this all works, right? We've we've got opportunities that were generated or sourced by partners. We want to keep them posted. So the way we do this, like here in, in Superglue, we would just just take a blueprint. Uh, if you have a tool that's not built for partnerships that you want to automate stuff with, you might obviously have to build this yourself. But you'll see it's not that difficult. Um, the ups. So we give it a name. Um, sorry. Uh, so this would be a partner sourced overlap moves into negotiation stage. You see that I'm terrible at multitasking too, so I'm not going to fix this. But uh, we're, we basically want to keep our team involved and alerted if a yeah if an overlap happens and moves into a certain stage in this case in the negotiation stage because that's when stuff gets um you know serious and when a partner can really help us drive this thing across the finish line uh, in this case i'm connecting my gmail account to this automation because all of this stuff should be triggered in my name and it should be sent from my gmail account rather than from some generic email. It's also what, what Eddie said earlier on. So now I'm going to click create. And now all that's left to do is I need to configure the trigger. I think that's obviously the important thing. What we see is that uh, a lot of people, you know, we've, we've talked to a lot of people how they track, uh, for example, partner influence. And most people, despite the fact that a lot of people talk about tracking partner influence at custom objects in Salesforce, most people have that in a, in a standard, in a custom field on the um on the opportunity level so basically what i'm telling super to now is that in which field i'm storing the account that is gonna the partner account that's helping me on this opportunity and then i tell um you know i basically configure the trigger i tell it hey this this deal negotiation needs to move into the negotiation stage and obviously we don't want this for every deal the deal has to be a partner source deal right um so we just say that the partner sourced deal field is not empty. So now we've set up the trigger. So now what happens next? Um, and I'm going to show you what the process looks like in you know when you when you actually activate this because this is not fully automated. This is also something that's kind of like the stuff that Kenny talked about. But let's let's finalize this automation. The first thing that should happen is an email should be sent out to our partner telling them that uh, that we're in the negotiation stage with one of the deals that they sourced for us. The What I find really interesting is adding actually additional steps. So we could, for example, add a wait step where we basically, where, for example, wait 30 days. And then after 30, 30 days, we have Superglue check if that deal is still stuck in the negotiation phase. So basically... So basically what we're doing is, yeah, we, after 30 days, if the deal still hasn't closed, and again, that time frame might be different for your business, uh, we create a task um, in, with AE, where basically the, now what, what, what we automate or what we created is a setup uh, that I'm going to show you in real life in a second, where um, the opportunity moving into a specific stage triggers this automation. It alerts the partner manager via Slack, and they can take action. They can inform their partner, but they will also be notified if that deal is still isn't closing. We can, of course, also automate follow-up emails, etc. So let's, let's let me show you what this looks like in uh, kind of in, in real life. This is my Slack, and in Slack, I get notifications to to handle different tasks. So this is I have different automation set up. In my, in my account here. So in this case, I want to onboard somebody, enable somebody. But what we just talked about, what we just set up is this partner sourced opportunity notification. So Superglue alerts me that a partner sourced opportunity is in the negotiation stage. The interesting thing about this automation is that hardly anybody tracks the actual contact that sourced the opportunity for you on the opportunity level. So now we need to link this opportunity that was sourced by a partner, in this case Accenture, to the actual person that needs that update. And the way we do this is we click Add Partner Manager. We're taking it to Superglue, where we've already pre-assigned a partner manager that the relevant partner manager, but we can change that if somebody else would be responsible. And then Superglue provides me the email templates to update that partner. 
uh, that includes important information, standard information, the stuff that Eddie mentioned earlier on, right? These custom fields that make this stuff important and relevant and helpful. But I can, of course, add additional stuff. Um, so as a, as a partner manager, I now have the ability to work with this template. I get alerted. I work with this template. I add additional content if, if necessary. And as you can see here, the you know we, after I alert, send this out, uh, super do waves, it checks after 30 days and then you know it sends me another notification slack if that deal is still stuck in the same phase. So I click save and approve and that's it. So what all right, so what we just did is um, we went through the process of, of creating an automation. This took us how long? I don't know, three minutes. Um, and these automations are, are so powerful because yeah, now we are a lot more aware of what's going on. And I think this is like also what I think, Kenny, what you mentioned, right? I think in partnerships, the more we work with signals, the more rather than us deciding, hey, I think we should build this integration, we should talk to this partner. Oh, I should check in with this person. If we work with signals and these signals and help us create relevant touch points, uh, we can be a lot more successful. In the case of this co cell motion of involving, keeping partners involved in the opportunities, I think there's a huge opportunity to, to actually leverage a, a mode of success to drive further excitement with our partners, right? Like, because we're not just enabling them to help us on their deal, we're showing them that we take this stuff seriously and we're showing them that this works, customers like it, and that, that creates a, a very nice. Um, a very nice effect that uh, spills over into further further revenue, further opportunities. So I love now to. Me... This is something that I, has been available for marketing teams for decades now. I feel like, and it's so cool that to see this be available for partner teams, like explicitly. I think it's yeah. awesome. I think and overall, I'm, I'm now like, oh, we need some more automations internally. <laughs> I, <laughs> I got think some overall, stuff to set up. <laughs> I think it's what you talked in the beginning, right? I think the, um, you know, if you look at other departments, they have all of these cool tools that are custom built. And I think in partnerships until, I mean, we've got three people here, right, that, that decided that, that there is a need for further tech. In partnerships for too long, we were stuck with basically Salesforce and then, you know, a couple of other tools that were built for other teams and us try, trying to tweak them to our needs. And I think that's just, and then we didn't have resources, right? We didn't have partner ops resources. So it's just a very, very painful situation where no tools, nobody to help us adjust the tools that could kind of solve our problems and basically us not being able to create the same kind of scale as other, uh, as other departments did. All right, let's move on to tracking. How can we track the return on the investment of this stuff? If I may start. <laughs> Go for it. I, I, I love this topic. So one other thing that I very often tell people is that um, I think in a lot of other areas and a lot of the other departments, people build business cases. They they track pretty much everything that's happening. A lot of tools actually build for tracking. If you look at sales enablement tools, a major kind of part of the functionality is about tracking performance, overlooking performance, et cetera. And I think in partnerships, we, we lack a lot of that. Uh, we lack tools that have that ca those capabilities. But I think it's very important, like you said, um, also to, if you, if you want to pitch what you're doing to the C-suite. So I think it starts with thinking about your goals before you take action and then think about easy ways to track. And I, I say easy ways because what I see very often is that people just like with automation, they try to go from nothing to these to very sophisticated tracking where you have everything under control. And I've made that mistake myself uh, three times already. <laughs> I'm trying not to make it at super glue uh, because that just means you create a monster. You're stuck basically building amazing reporting over six months. And the interesting thing is then you end up with these reports and half of them are useless. So I think it's about taking a very step-by-step -step approach and a very focused approach. That's the other thing. I think as an, we have a lot of, I know partnership impacts everybody, like every department in your organization. But if you try to measure the impact on every organization, you're just, 
you're spreading yourself thin. I personally think you need to focus. You need to focus on the top one, two, three benefits or impact the, the impact you're driving, and you need like that. You create a clear narrative and a story, and you can position your partner department rather than feeling like this, you know, this great team in your organization that kind of does everything but that does not nothing properly. Um, so that's kind of my my take on on tracking and analytics. Yeah. And I, I think it's important to know what the outcomes you're trying to get are because you need to be able to track against it. But one of the things that I've run into and a lot of people end up running into is you build out automations thinking, you know, you're trying to get to a certain outcome. Maybe you're trying to accelerate onboarding a new partner, right? Um, you accelerate onboarding a new partner, but you're still not actually generating any net new leads out of this, you're getting the same number of leads. And so you're measuring the wrong thing. But maybe you go and your goal is to get increased time to first lead from each partner. And so accelerating their onboarding is going to be important. Well, you go do that. But then that might have been the slowest thing or the thing blocking you the most. You've now got the next one you have to go do until you go through your process. And so it's very much a your entire system only works as fast as your slowest thing and figure out what that slowest thing is, automate it so it can do more, and then you're gonna find what your next slowest thing is to automate all towards that one goal at the end, whether that's generate more revenue or accelerate time to first referral from a partner, whatever it is, you're gonna find the slowest thing, fix that and keep working forward and forward and forward. I think it's interesting how that approach will also impact the way that we look at KPIs and the way that we measure internal success. Uh, if, if anyone's ever used a platform, like uh, a couple of the email automation platforms, one of them is called Lemlist. There's a few others that will show you how much time you've saved uh, by using their product. Uh, and it'll say you've saved three hours. That's enough for you to go outside and have a lunch or a walk. Uh, but basically like that becomes an automation KPI. And if you're a C-suite or you're looking at uh, the efficiency of the company, you're looking at those two things and those items you mentioned, Kenny, like time to onboard, time to first uh, launch. But what uh, I could see people getting to a point where they're actually breaking down the automations that took place in between uh, the task saves, the time saved. Uh, and so I think it's it's a, a way, a direction that things are going. And there's no reason why the partner teams couldn't lead that. Uh, I think it, there's an interesting opportunity to start looking at those. Yeah, I actually really like that because one of the things we talk about a lot in partnership is reciprocity to your partners. But in reality, one of the things that started to dawn on me recently is you also need to do that internally. You need to provide value to your sales team, your CSM team, your support team, your product team, because you're asking for things from that. And so that reciprocity needs to be internal and making sure that you're focusing on the right impacts that your team can make to benefit those other groups. To Rob's point, you can't do every KPI for every group, but focus on the right things for how you're going to give them value because then they're going to actually care what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Totally. Great points. Yeah, and like what we showed here, right? I think the interesting thing is, Eddie, you said, like you mentioned that you could go on a walk uh, if you save three hours. Unfortunately, we never do. <laughs> no. <laughs> the, the, and this is like what this, this graph shows, this, this visualization shows, right? The, I think the, what happens, I have zero fear that partnerships will be like that, you know, partner teams will be automated and replaced with bots. Uh, it's just like, especially partnerships is very people driven. It's very relationship driven. There's so much, there's a lot of project work. So, but I do think that uh, we can become a lot more productive. Um, and what happens if you, the more automation tools you implement, uh, the more you do it, the more you drive an impact. And you obviously, if you measure that properly, you have a great story internally. Yeah, you, you mentioned something right there, Rob, that I think is really important is that partnerships are always going to be about the relationship. It's always going to be about you and the other person, let alone the other company. And automations, a lot of people have this fear that they're going to remove that personal experience. Um, and it's not, you can, sometimes you'll build an automation that does that. And that's just a bad automation again, garbage in garbage out. But when you do it right, the automations are just making both of your lives better. So the time you spend together on your relationship is that much more valuable. Exactly. 
All right. I love that. What a great um, discussion today. I certainly learned some stuff. I'm, I was so excited about this and it was, <laughs> and it was really great. Um, I am going to be sending out uh, all of these slides for anybody that missed anything or wants to review anything. Uh, we're going to send out the recording as well. Please feel free to contact um, any three of them, Kenny, Eddie, or Rob. I put their email addresses here. Um, write them down, send an email if you have any questions or if you want to learn any, especially if you want to learn anything more about Partner Fleet, Partner Portal, Portal or Superglue. Um, and we do have a few more minutes uh, for Q&A. If anybody has any questions that they want specifically answered uh, by Rob, Kenny, and or Eddie, um, while I'm waiting around to see if anybody does have any questions, I wanted to do another um, testimonial of Superglue uh, from Chris, uh, Krista. Krista? So sorry Krista, if yeah. I totally <laughs> bungled your name. Superglue has made our life easier in reactivating onboarding and enabling partners. Um, that's just so great to hear uh, that they've been able to do that. Um, we do have a question from Laura. Um, what do you think are the best practices in integrating automation with the personal touch that creates real relationships and trust? That's a great question. I, I'll kick it off with my yeah. quick answer there is uh, ultimately marketing's been doing this for a decade now. Um, we should definitely take, learn from their tips and tricks on how to use automation and still keep that personal touch. Sales has been doing it as well. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel to make sure that we're doing it. But what we need to do is make sure that the automations themselves, we're not auditing, audit, automating away any chance for that personal touch. We're actually incorporating it into every automation. Yeah. And then there's, there's just so much access to additional data points that can help influence that personalization. Again, looking at like a marketer, like any type of intent signals, uh, any type of uh, like first party signals, the way they're engaging with, with your website or, or even your partners, uh, there's enough of that to make it relevant enough uh, but I, I think it, it has to be done really tastefully. It, it's the same thing with sales. Like there's a good, a good right way to do it and definitely a wrong way. I think the, um, probably you'll be surprised. So I, I have this, I see this a lot when I talk to organizations, very often people are like, oh, we don't have any data about our partners. And then you look into their CRM and there are, there is more data than you think that you can use. Uh, so just two examples uh, of standard fields that everybody has in Salesforce the last activity date and the contact created date. So you can already use those two to, to uh, combine with, for example, a partner tier or a partner type to create alerts, right? If, if a contact is created, you know that that contact is new. So you can set up automations, reminders based on the newness of that contact in terms of onboarding, enabling them. The You can also use it, um, you know, I always, you just mentioned this, Kenny, right? Look at other programs. Look at loyalty programs. The most successful campaign and most loyalty programs are birthday campaigns. Basically just sending an email, hey, happy birthday, here's your discount. Why? Because it feels so personal, even if it's automated. And we know it's automated. You can do similar things with the content creator date. It's been a year that we've been in touch uh, here. You know, how happy are you? What can we do for you? It is, so a lot of this, so I'm now talking about the, the full automation or the more automated stuff or the notifications. Last activities today is very powerful because it tells you when you last talked to somebody, uh, you should be aware of the fact that if the last activity date is more than like six months ago, that person has forgotten about you. Like if you haven't interacted, if they haven't interacted with your organization, they're doing other stuff. They're not, that rep is not going to talk to a customer and remember you unless it's so, that's such a perfect fit. So you can build up smart automations on these standard fields that you have available. Uh, and then how do you add the personal touch? Well, like I just showed you that process where the way we do it, we enable, we, we set up alerts or you can set up alerts with other tools and you can then obviously um, customize things based on that specific contact. The, I think the thing with the personal touch is it, it depends also it depends on the use case, but it also depends on the persona. So, um, you know, a, a junior AE in a tier three partner <laughs> that was in a, in a lunch and learn probably doesn't need the same type of personal touch as the, 
I don't know, SVP that uh, works in your top partner and, uh, you know, just brought you into a big deal. So, but that data is all available in, in, in your CRM usually, and you just need to use it and think about how to, how to incorporate it in, in a, an automated or semi-automated or just an alert uh, setting process. Or... Yeah. I also think that to add to that is, I don't know, in my personal life, when I was running partnerships, when I, you know, even here reaching out to customers, prospects, my emails are pretty dang similar. Right. Because mm -hmm. I have a, a specific goal, whether I'm setting up a QBR with a customer or I'm setting up an intro call with a partner, I'm giving similar information with just a little bit of personalization. And so mm -hmm. it's not hard to go ahead and start automating those. The second one, Rob, and this is tied to what you said earlier, all of us have received the high first underscore name emails in the past. Right. Yeah. We've all known that we're all getting automated mm -hmm. all the time, but that I mean, for me personally, that's never ruined a relationship. That's never been like, oh, they don't care about me. They don't know who I am. Um, but I've had personal emails where they've sent something and I'm like, I don't want to work with you anymore based on the way you wrote that email. And so there's a little bit of that on both sides. Yeah, yeah I think the fear, like the, the, the fear of automation, I think in partnerships, I very often compare it to sales 10, 15 years ago when people started using sales enablement tools. And I remember like talking to my sales teams, like, um, you know, when we implemented these tools and everybody being like, hey, this is going to ruin my relationships. This is like, I can't automate selling. Uh, and then they realized that we're not automating selling. We are automating tedious recurring tasks that you would have probably forgotten uh, or that would have like wasted your time would have taken time away from more important stuff. Uh, and that's, I think that's how we got to see automation. That was so great. Um, we are going to be uh, kicked out in one minute. Um, so I, uh, from the software, no, in three minutes. Um, so we do have one more question that I want to hop into. But right before I do that, um, we did want to uh, pitch a couple of things. First of all, Partner Fleet is launching our in-app marketplace. Um, we will be launching the blog post for that today. And we're going to be doing a bunch of promotions. So go follow us on LinkedIn and um, check out our in-app marketplace. We're really excited about launching this super amazing new product. Um, and we wanted to let everybody know about that. Um, Rob from Superglue wants everybody to go sign up for his newsletter. Uh, he put the link into the chat, but we can repost it again. Accidentally, uh, I didn't want to be, you know, like obnoxious. <laughs> just, but everybody if knows that I, I suck at If like, you want to, if you didn't enjoy the yeah. content you've seen here today, you'll see similar stuff in his newsletter. And then Eddie, do you want to, um, do you want to pitch something too? Yeah, we, we launched our Zapier integration uh, about a month or two ago, and we've got a handful of users on it. Uh, but we're always looking for new use cases. So if you're in the market for a partner portal and you want to have it synced up and connected to the type form or anywhere else on the web, I uh, would love to hear, hear your example. Uh, so that's my, that's my shout out. Very cool. Lots of new automations there. All right. We've got one other question um, that we want to hop into with the last minute. What is your experience with companies' data sets? Are they clean enough to go and set up automation or is there usually a cleanup process first? to have all the data in the right place and how much training behaviors, how much training behaviors so teams actually update CRM records. I think the data data isn't as clean as in other departments very often, but there are ways around it. Um, I mean, what I showed you earlier on, I showed you alerts, et cetera. Uh, that's, that's why full automation is problematic. Uh, very often it's problematic for other reasons too. Um, so yeah, there is a cleaner process that's evolved some mostly, but again, if, if, as you set up an automation, there are ways around that and it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't keep you, your data shouldn't keep you from setting up automations. Uh, Cause I've seen people very, Oh, we can do this in a year when we've cleaned our data and it's just, then nothing. Yeah, happens, I, to be honest. It also comes back to the KPIs that you're going for. If you do this and you don't clean the data beforehand and you get a 2% success rate, but then instead you spent time, you know, a week cleaning up the data manually beforehand and you get a 25% success rate. That's a huge difference. And so it really just depends on how you're going to define success because that 2% is probably not going to make you ever do it again. Don't, I'd say don't let the data hold you back. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. So either either create something that's just going forward or um, see if you've got the resources to get some of that data cleaned up to the point where you can use it. It's a cool thing about automations. You can just you can draw, draw a line in the sand and just move forward. Well, thank you all very much for coming to this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Again, I will be sending out an email uh, with the slides and with the recording. Uh, we will be in touch with everybody when we, I'm sure that the three of us will do um, more things again in the future. I thought this was great. Um, so we'll be in touch with everybody there. And yeah, go, uh, go sign up for some newsletters, check out the partner portal Zapier integration and check out our new in-app marketplace. Thanks again. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.